All right. Um, let me go ahead and start here. Um, actually, it might not, I might not uh, have like a full session here. Um, I was thinking about wrapping up a few things, uh, but I haven't had anybody join yet. So um, I'll just post some announcements here and post this video and then I, I probably will bring these up, but I might not talk about um, these things too much. Uh, but, but like I said, I, I was planning on talking a little bit more about assignment five. Um, and, you know, if you guys have questions about those, make certain that you send those to me. So, um, so looking, you know, kind of wrapping up here, there, there is some suggestions for some stuff to read through for unit 15 um, this week, uh, kind of some big picture sorts of things. So um, kind of going back and looking about um, Dr. Ng's videos and from our textbook about um, practical advice for doing uh, uh, data analytics and machine learning as a whole. So uh, like I said, maybe I'll say a few words about that, but I'm not certain how I'm feeling up to saying too much about it. So, um, so you know, as a rem reminder, we do have the assignment five last, it's gonna be our last assignment. Um, and um, that is due like on Sunday's usual, the, the 12th. So, um, so we still have a little bit of time on that. Uh, I've had a few questions about it, so keep sending me those if you have those. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about, try and talk a little bit more about PCA here in a second. So, um, and then test two. Um, so let me say a little bit about that. The um, test two will be of the same format as test one. Um, so in theory, it is comprehensive, um, although there will be a definite emphasis on the uh, materials that we covered since the first test. So kind of the stuff past the, the linear and logistic regression. So kind of after that, then we got into uh, more varied machine learning algorithms. So support vector machines and K nearest neighbors and um, uh, trees and ensembles, a little bit, things like that. Okay. And of course, unsupervised learning that we've been looking at for the last uh, week or two. So those, those will probably be, most of the questions will be on the, uh, on those. Although, you know, you might have to, for example, compare a linear regression and a support vector machine uh, for a regression problem or something like that. So you might still have to do, you know, a linear regression or a logistic regression or something like that. So uh, but yeah, the test will be completely online. And, and in fact, I mean, I think in the schedule, I had it being opened up starting Monday. We, we have to have everything done before Friday. And in fact, I might, um, uh, well, um, I'd really like things to be due before midnight, but, but okay, I'm, I'm not gonna go back and change that. But, but anyway, so I've really given kind of all of the finals week to work on this, um, on this the second test here. So it'll be in the same format as the first one. So there'll be a um, um, IPython notebook that you can download uh, once the test becomes available. And um, there'll be probably three or four questions. Um, you know, there'll probably be at least one on unsupervised learning. So doing something like a principal component analysis or something like that. And then a couple on like maybe a trees or um, some things like that. Right? So I'll give you some data and ask you to build a model um, with those um, and do your work in the notebook and then submit that um, again to the um, provided uh, uh, submission folder for the test, right? So, you know, doesn't have a lot of difference from our assignments, just a little bit less time um, and a little bit more kind of focused question. Well, not really, so kind of a more of a, a review, some questions that are kind of review of, of materials and topics. So that, that's basically what's in test two. So yeah, I don't know if anybody has any questions about that or questions, you know, you, you should basically review your assignments. That's the best place to look at uh, things. So, so start by looking at your assignments, make certain you understood those, make certain you understood any feedback that I gave to you guys on, on the assignments. And that, that would be pretty good preparation for the test. Then you can go back and, um, you know, look through your lecture notebooks um, and our textbook. So. Um, All right, so yeah, that, that was kind of all the thoughts I had about that. So let me, um, let's, let's um, um, talk a little bit more about principal component analysis, well, about assignment five in particular. So um, I have had one or two questions, although nobody's asked me yet anything too 
detailed about uh, PCA. Okay, so um, you know, I suspect the first part here hopefully will be relatively easy. That where where you do some things to to create some functions and and, and implement the K K means clustering. So so do some things with clustering um, on an example data set. Right. Um, So on the, the, the second part might be a little bit more difficult. Um, so I ask you to implement some parts of principal component analysis by hand. Okay, so we're gonna be actually implementing some functions. So, so writing some functions that actually do the same things as uh, a PCA would do. So, so you, can, you can do PCA from, um, you know, like scikit-learn. In fact, at the end, I think, you know, um, I've got some cells where we check and compare uh, that to a PCA, is that, is that not true? Maybe that's not true. So I thought it did, but, but maybe not. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, you, know, you, could, you can use scikit-learn to do uh, PCA or other things. Um, I had, there's some examples that in the, um, the, the, the textbooks. Um, so, um, so anyway, the, the second part of the assignment is uh, doing some principal component analysis and then using that for some dimensionality reduction where I kind of walk you through uh, implementing some parts of the PCA by, PCA by hand, okay? So, <laughs> so you, you'll be implementing um, some parts of PCA. Um, so the way PCA works um, as, you know, our, our um, lecture videos that you, hopefully you've watched by now, um, uses a um, mechanism called um, singular value decomposition, which kind of splits the original matrix into three separate component matrices, right? So, um, Um, so we start by normalizing the data. And then I have you to compute the um, covariance matrix here. Um, So, um, so you know, to, to create the, the covariance, covariance matrix, um, you know, you just have to kind of do this. Um, so this is a mathematical expression. Hopefully everybody can kind of uh, interpret that. So you, so you take the original matrix X and you, multi, you do a matrix multiplication times its transpose and you divide all the values by n. So the result is going to be the same. Well, the result is going to be an n by n matrix. Um, but this is what we normally compute the, do the singular value decomposition on for principal component analysis is this um, covariance matrix, OK? So again, I believe we talked a little bit about what that is and, and why we do that in our lecture videos. So. Um, and, and, you know, probably Dr. Ng explains it uh, pretty well, better than, than maybe I did in some of my lecture videos. So. Um, and, and, but then I'm going to, I kind of wanted you to implement this PCA function to, to do a singular value decomposition by hand, okay? So, um, Um, so yeah, I mean PCA is, is done on the the, at the normalized X. Um, so it's not that we use the um, we use this um, um, covariance matrix uh, later on here. So um, um, or inside of so, so we use that inside of this part of the um, of the um, PCA function here. So. Um, Uh, 
Right. So, so you should first, uh, yeah. So actually, inside of the function, you should create the the, the covariance matrix, um, which you need for singular value decomposition. Um, and you know, I, 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 you you could do explicitly, but it's pretty easy to vectorize this and, and do this as a matrix multiplication. I hope you know. So you just have to take the transpose of the x that's passed in and, and do a, a dot product or a matrix multiplication times the original x divided by m. That should give you that sigma matrix, okay? So then the next thing that you, you need to do um, um, is, you know, we're, we're gonna actually, you know, reuse an implementation of singular value decomp decomposition or also called SVD to do the actual principal component analysis. Okay? So, I mean, principal component analysis is just singular value decomposition um, um, at its heart, basically, right? So, um, so if, if you look at the definition of the, um, Let's let's bring up. Um, um, I, di I didn't state, state it explicitly, but let's bring up that function from NumPy .lin algebra. So um, uh, probably we, we might have already imported this above in this notebook for you. But um, so we, we've got uh, NP imported, although I may not run anything in this notebook. All right, um, and then. I believe it's just called singular value decomposition, SVD, right? So um, let's look at the um, documentation for this function here, right? So, um, So it takes, uh, besides you know some the, the um, parameters that you can specify for things, it basically takes uh, the matrix that we want to decompose, right? Um, so you want to you want to call SVD on the um, uh, computed covariance matrix, right? Um, and um, it returns, basically it returns this U and S matrix for you. Um, um, so it actually returns uh, three things, the um, unitary array, the, the singular values, which are the eigenvectors um, and the unitary values. So, um, so those are usually referred to as uh, U, S and V, yeah. Um, so, 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 so calling this should return those three things for you after decomposing it uh, in there. So, so they should have an example of, of doing that down here. So, so yeah, I mean, if you call single value decomposition on some matrix A, whatever it is, you'll get the US and V matrices, right? Um, So uh, I can't remember exactly. We, we don't really need the the, the V matrix um, usually, um, uh, but but we do need the U and the S. So all, all you do then is just return the resulting uh, um, uh, um, unitary array and the, the the resulting singular values, the the, the eigen uh, values uh, here. Right. So you just end up returning the U and the S. Okay. So. Um, So yeah, if you do it on the, um, the, the, the normalized X um, that we're supposed to be working on at this point, um, I mean, you should get this for your U matrix and you should get these for the singular values, um, the, the eigenvector here, right? right. Um, 
So yeah, I mean, the, the, the rest of this assignment is, is trying to then give you a little bit more of an intuitive understanding of, of what these things give you, okay? Um, so, so each of the columns of the U vector, um, each column represents a vector um, and that defined basically uh, the direction uh, with regard to the original space that the new um, dimensional access goes on. Okay, so that's kind of what the U's are. And then S, uh, the, the singular values represents the amount of variation in that principal component. So a way that I think about that, you know, so it's the importance, uh, you know, that's kind of what we mean by principal component. Um, and, you know, the most important vector. So, so the column represents the vector in the space. And this represents the, the variance. The, the most important one is always going to be in the first column, the second most important one, the second one. And then the relative values of these singular values um, um, tells you how important each component is in, in the new space that was found, right? So, and also these uh, are, are a, uh, kind of a measure of the amount of variation found in that dimension, okay? So, um, Um, yeah, I don't think you have to do anything here. If, if, you, if you implemented this function correctly, when you run this cell, you'll see the result. Um, so you should end up getting the, the, the first vector that uh, goes along this dimension because the mo it, so it, it found that the most amount of, of variance in this data um, uh, is if we had dimension going roughly in this, uh, this angle here that I'm kind of indicating, right? So, so that has the most amount of difference between you know, one end and the other, right? So that'll end up being the first dimension, the one with the singular value 1.7355, right? And then all other dimensions, like I mentioned before, have to be orthogonal to that, dimen to that um, um, dimension that we define, right? So that means they have to be at right angles. So in this case, we've only got two dimensional space. So the second dimension will just be the, the one that's the right angle to that, right? Uh, and so this one has, relatively lesser amount of uh, variance, right? So it's only about one seven, one, one eighth, uh, one eighth of the of that, which roughly means that the the, the distance between the, the 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 point the furthest points away in this direction is one eighth of the distance between the points furthest away in this dimension of lines. Okay. So that's roughly what it's doing, right? And, and you know, if you go back and look at um, our lecture notebooks, uh, there were some similar drawings like that for the PCA from Dr. Ng and from um, uh, uh, myself, right? So, you know, we're basically doing the same thing as what I'm talking about here. So after we find the principal components, um, the, the U and the V vectors on a set of data like this, um, it's basically determined what the uh, new axis should be for the most important dimension that captures the most amount of variation. And then all the other axes will be orthogonal to that. And you know, you'll have the second most important um, uh, dimension. And you know, if, if this was higher than two dimensions, it would, it would go on in order to get all of the dimensions in the feature space, right? So since we only had two features here, and we only had two features um, in um, the data that you're doing for the assignment, there's only two dimensions. But you know, if I had if I had if I had a hundred features, you'd end up with, you know, um, um, you'd end up with a hundred columns um, here, hundred rows by hundred columns, um, and and these that data in each column would represent how to determine what the axis is um, in, in your space, basically. And then again, these would be the, the, the singular values, which is kind of a measure of the relative importance of each one of those new dimensions in that space. After you do the transformation, right? So then when you're doing principal component analysis, after you find these, we end up just re-rotating the, the space to, you know, to use this as feature one, you know, as if we rotated it, um, so that now this becomes like our new feature one um, on this angle, this becomes our new feature two, right? That's kind of what you would do with, with PCA when you apply it. 
Um, okay, so that's what you should get um, when if you do the implementing PCA. Uh, and then in the second part, uh, we're going to, so after you compute the principal components, um, you can use them to reduce the, the feature dimensions, right? So um, again, it's not too useful if you only have two features, but if I have a hundred features, I might keep only the, the 10 most important ones or something like that, right? Because the ones less than that um, capture less of the information in the original data, right? Um, All right, so if, if you implement this correctly, um, this project data, I mean, you should get this as the result. So what this does is this, this projects each of the original data points into the uh, most important dimension, right? So, so basically, if you imagine a line, here's, again, um, you know, I think we've done similar things in the, the lectures here. So um, uh, like here, right? So, so, you know, if this was our original, um, most important dimension along this angle here, we're projecting all these points down to that one dimension, right? So that would be the 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 the, the value of the point. So here, you know, um, you know, so, so the point right here would, would be zero because that's you know we're just rotating this. But the point here, if you rotate it up, would end up being around negative you know, two, negative, negative two, three or something, right? Uh, along this new axis, it's, it's three units away um, uh, in this direction. Likewise up here, this one's, oh, that'd be negative three, this would be close to positive three when you rotated this back around, right? Um, so anyway, that's, that's what the project data is, is, that's all it's supposed to be doing, right? So again, if you do it correctly for this data set that we were using, you would get these um, as the first five values in our data set here. We describe how to do that um, here. Um, well, yeah, so I guess the most important thing is here, kind of, I, I am. Um, um, so the easiest way to do this, compute the reduction. Um, um, is, yeah, so for each particular value, so each, for each particular, remember this is the row, and that's the column of X. So we, for each particular row, if you iterate over all the rows, um, if you multiply um, the x times this u reduce that you have here doing a matrix multiplication, that, that will give you the, the projection of that data point onto the new axis, basically, right? So there's probably a way to do this in a you know vectorized way to avoid the loop, but, uh, but yeah, you can first try and just do it as a loop and then maybe think about how you might vectorize that to, to um, avoid having to loop over every row individually here, right? Um, and you also have to complete the recover data. Um, so you can actually do the reverse. Um, you know, if, if you have that projected unit and you still have the that, that U matrix, um, uh, you can recover it by multiplying by the whole thing instead of just the first k components, right? Um, so 
or, well, that, that gives an approximation um, in the original space. Um, so, you, so yeah, you, you do that, you, you first project it and then you recover it. Um, and that gives you, you know, again, the um, something like this, right? Uh, if, you re if you reduce it from two down to one dimension and you project it and recover it, you get these points uh, back in the original two dimensional space, but they will all have been projected down to just the single most important principal dimension, principal component that was found here, so, right? Um, yeah, and, and that's basically it. So when you do those and you run these, you should get a similar figure to that one I keep kind of jumping back and forth to. Um, hopefully not, not too difficult. I mean, you know, so some complex stuff is happening here, but it, it, if, if you understand, you know, the, the mathematics, the actual calculations really aren't that difficult. Um, all right, yeah, and that was kind of all that I was thinking about saying about assignment five. So like I said, I've had a few questions about it, but uh, you know, if you have some more as you're finishing up, um, you know, go ahead and feel free to email me at any time and I can answer specific questions about these. So. Um, All right, and then like I said, so I'm gonna be pretty quick here. Um, I'll just mention a couple of things here. So I, I didn't have anything specific that I wanted to get into into detail um, on this last week here. So I, I, I was um, suggesting that maybe you go back and think about some big picture things. So there's, there's two in particular, there, there's um, some similar material from Dr. Ng's videos that you ought to watch. So it's good advice just overall of, of how you might apply machine learning to, you know, if you find yourself in a real world situation where you need to apply these, right? So, so really the, the first two chapters of our Gary and Peck book talk about those, um, you know, kind of so going back to that, you know, especially kind of this example of the end, end machine learning um, project, but we, we kind of had a lecture notebook um, that we went through on that, so that was, the example uh, where we have some some data of housing in California and made some points with that. Um, but the other thing I thought I would discuss just a little bit um, is the appendix B here, right? So kind of go back and um, uh, looking back over what we covered in this course, right? So you know, really. Um, What you mostly have done on this course is uh, kind of five, right? You learned, and, and really not even five, you, you learned a little bit about the, the um, um, some of the most important, some, some of the most uh, basic uh, machine learning models, and, and then how to um, uh, use them to, to build a prediction engine, whether you're doing a regression predictions or um, or do some sort of a categorization problem if we're talking about supervised learning. So I'm mostly back to talking about supervised learning here again, right? So, so um, you know, so if you're doing a real project, uh, you know, you might, usually it's best to start with simple models, right? So, um, and, and I think there's some advice similar to this uh, when, you, when you get down here, you know, but, but, you know, when you get to fine tuning, so, so the goal is you want to build the best predictor that you can. So in that case, you might, start trying to, to build um, different predictors with different uh, types of machine learning uh, methods, right? And, and compare the results. And at that point, then uh, you could be comparing the results using different machine learning models um, and fine tuning those models. And then maybe also do some of the stuff like we talked about for um, 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 ensembles, uh, aggregations, uh, boosting, bagging sorts of things, and maybe combine those to get uh, uh, even better solutions, right? Um, so, but, but yeah, I mean, most of the stuff we've done this course is really five and maybe a little bit of six. Right? Uh, we, we, we briefly mentioned, you know, data exploration and data preparation. Again, that was kind of more back at the beginning of the course. Uh, these, if you ask any working data scientists nowadays, I mean, they'll say, 
um, straight up that often, you know, like 80 or 90 percent of their job is really these first four steps, you know, getting the data, data exploration, uh, and data munging, data wrangling, um, data preparation, right? So that, that takes a lot of time. And, and, you know, this course maybe does a little bit of a disservice to, to skip over those, but, but it is a whole course in and of itself, right? So, so, you know, you shouldn't think that you're an expert, at, you know, that, that you can jump out and be a data scientist, uh, after taking a course like this, you know, so, so one definite deficiency would be to go back and to really practice and, and learn about visualizing data and exploring it um, and wrangling it, um, you know, so data cleaning, right? Anytime you, you get thrown in t with real data, um, it's often going to be messy, you know, and, and, and I mean, not often, I mean, it's guaranteed to be and, and it can be a real challenge a real time consuming part of being able to work with it to actually get it into a clean state first before you can think, even begin to think about how I might um, build some models in order to, to use that data to do something with it, make predictions or recommendations or whatever your business use case is. So. Um, and then, like I said, you know, we talked a little bit about five and six. We, we you know, you, you did a little bit with um, Scikit-Learn, um, uh, doing some grid searches and stuff, you know, so, so that's some of the stuff that you iterate through here. So, uh, but again, you know, people I talk about and, and talk with, and, and when, you know, if you talk to people that are actually out there in the real world, um, a lot of them will say that, you know, this is only, you know, 10%, 20% at most, kind of the job, you know, actually building models. And another thing that's, that's a little bit of a, you know, well-known secret, but uh, I mean, it's, it's often the case in 90% of, of the business use cases that really simple models are, are all you really need for the, the, the business use case at hand, right? So, you know, it's, uh, assuming you've got something in the data that has a good clear signal after you clean it and prepare it, um, a simple logistic regression or, or a simple um, a tree applied to it, um, decision tree or something like that, um, is going to be, you know, is, is going to work great on the data lots of times, right? Not always, but, but lots of times, right? So, so it, again, it's, you know, of the 10 or 20% of the time you spend on this, you know, only 10 or 20% of the time. Um, are you going to have to do something more um, more complex, right? So, so really get into like, like the kind of stuff you might do on like a Kago competition of having to explore many different models and compare them and maybe get into aggregating and um, um, combining models and stuff like that. So. All right. And then seven and eight, you know, we, we didn't really talk at all about in this course. Um, I mean, in real production environments, you know, um, um, there's lots of issues which act with actually launching a machine learning or data analytics model or project to be able to use it in a real system to monitor its performance, maintain it, update it, um, you know, um, and, and things like that, right? So, um, and then, you know, I, I liked this checklist personally uh, at the end of our textbook here, right? So, so each one of these it breaks down into um, a smaller sub uh, tasks, smaller checklists. So, um, you know, defining the big picture, um, you know, getting the data, right? So, um, there's lots of things to worry about here before you can even work with it. Yeah. Uh, especially nowadays, you, know, you have to worry about uh, privacy. Um, you, know, you have to take ethical considerations uh, in in, uh, in in hand um, um, if you're working with data that, that might have uh, information about users in it, all those kinds of things. And then data exploration. Um, you know, like I said, we, we touched a little bit on this, but we didn't talk a whole lot about. Uh, data exploration in our class, but then, you know, uh, uh, getting good at understanding how to visualize data, how to use um, um, uh, graphs and figures 
to be able to better understand. And, and that's, that's also useful for presenting your uh, results and communicating with other people, right? So, so we're very visual creatures. So, so if you can actually get it into pictures, um, um, that helps a lot or, or you know, good summary tables, things like that. Um, but you know, this is kind of a necessary step before preparing the data, uh, because kind of at the other at the, at the end of this, uh, you also do things like begin to think about feature engineering. So, looking at the features you have and, and studying um, the the relationships between the features, and maybe uh, doing some things to figure out which features might be important, which feature might be less important. Maybe dropping features that are really just redundant or or correlated with each other, that kind of stuff in order to try and improve the performance of um, your actual models when you get to that step. Uh, um, prior, then preparing the data, um, you know, so all these kinds of things. Again, we, we, we mostly have to only talked about this for one or two weeks, but um, um, these are often big problems in real data. So, you know, find outliers and fix them. Missing data is, you know, lots, lots of data, is, real data is going to have big parts of it that are missing um, values here and there, right? So you always have to make a decision when you want to use that to build models and stuff, you know, how am I going to use that? Am I going to ignore my samples that have missing data? I'm going to, or I'm going to try to fill that in or, or whatever. Feature selection, feature engineering, like I talked about, right? Um, um, often, like, if, if a simple model is not working, then you might have to go to something more complex, you know, support vector machine or something like that and start trying to use nonlinear kernels, right? Um, you know, like, like I've said, um, you know, we don't normally kind of engineer, let's say, nonlinear combinations of features by hand, um, like we did do a bit uh, when we were looking at linear regression um, and logistic regression, but you know, similar things to um, um, uh, adding in using kernel methods for support vector machines or other stuff like that might be necessary. Um, normalization and feature scaling, that kind of stuff is all part of um, preparing the data. Um, and then, and then, yeah, sort of for actually creating models so you can compare them and see what's going to work. Um, um, so so my my advice on this is, I mean, maybe even before this, um, um, have a simple baseline, right? So um, if your data is, if you're doing like a classification task and your data is well split, so it's 50% true, 50% false, then, you know, a random guesser, if you just randomly guess, or if you always guess true, um, or we just randomly guess with a 50-50 chance, um, you should get uh, performance, a uh, 50% accuracy rate in that case, right? So, you know, when you have a simple, an idea of what a simple baseline is like that, you can tell whether your real model, um, your, your, your model is doing better than that, is it actually doing something or not, right? So uh, here is where you have to begin worrying about unbalanced data, which, um, I don't know if we didn't, we only talked a little bit about, but, you know, if you're doing a classification task and 70% of the data is true and, and only 30% is false, models that can't do better than 70% performance um, probably really aren't doing anything, you know, because I can always guess true and get 70% performance, right? So, so that's kind of what the usefulness, what I mean by having a, an idea of baseline performance and, and what usefulness might be. So often baseline performance is just a, you know, a random guesser or always guessing one value, like for a classification problem, you know, or the equivalent for like, if it's a regression problem. You know. um, but yeah, at this stage, you know, you might, start with simple models, linear regression or um, uh, BAID or SVM and not do a lot of um, uh, tuning of metaparameters and not worry about regularization so much, but, but just doing that to, to train a couple of different models to compare them to the baseline and with one another to see, uh, to, 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 to measure and compare their performance, right? 
Right. And here's where you might want to start bringing in, you know, cross-validation, um, like we talked about, and, and, so, um, um, and, and then, well, grid search, then you'd probably do that um, kind of the next step here. Right. And then, yeah, the, the kind of the what they call the fine tuning system is probably where you're going to get into. Um, and, and a lot of times it might not be necessary to, to get real deep into this, you know, so, so you know, simple models might be sufficient for, for lots of kinds of data. But if not, you, know, you might have to fine tune your metaparameters. So start worried about um, regularization um, um, and um, uh, uh, maybe doing more kinds of feature engineering. Um, things like that, then and maybe also uh, doing some ensembles, right? So, so if you're still not getting the performance you need, you might have to start thinking about combining some models using some bagging or boosting or something like that. All right, and then presenting your solution and um, you know um, uh, launching a real product, right? Again, you know, of course, doesn't touch on this at all. But if you ever become a real data scientist, you know, so that that's going to be an important um, um, aspect of, of doing well um, in, in a real situation, applying machine learning to those things. So. Um, All right, so anyway, you know, I kind of just wanted to wrap up this course, maybe talking about a few of those things, you know, because I mean, there, there is a big demand um, uh, for data analytics and machine learning um, kind of at all levels, you know, and, and I, I think that that demand is just gonna keep growing because we're really only at the beginning of, um, of a more widely being able to apply uh, machine learning and, and AI um, to, to many different kinds of business, industry, um, government, uh, all areas of, of, of things. So, so, you know, our societies are more and more data driven. There's more and more ability to have data collected for different things and then to be able to turn around and use that to improve processes and things, right? And uh, um, yeah, and, and I don't think that this is going to be, um, you know, a, a, um, any kind of a data learning or AI sort of winter, right? So, so this isn't part of the normal sort of boom bust uh, that, that different machine learning mechanisms go through right now. So, so deep learning arguably right now is, is kind of very popular, but you know, uh, it, it might be going through a bit of a boom and, and we might see that it, it falls out of favor. Um, 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 after a while here, um, while people start looking at other specific machine learning algorithms, right? So I'm not, I'm not really talking about that kind of cycle uh, in the AI machine learning. I mean, here, um, um, there's just a fundamental need, a fundamental transformation of lots of areas of society to be data-driven. Um, so, you know, lots of areas that have never needed it before can benefit from and use people that can take data uh, uh, and, and apply models for it to improve processes, to better understand um, results, um, uh, you know, increase performance, reduce costs, all those kinds of things can happen um, with better sorts of data analytics being added into the process, right? So, so I do think that for for foreseeable future, if you're interested in this course because you're interested in trying to maybe get into data analytics, there's a lot of opportunity for that, right? So you know, if we go back and kind of look at that checklist, you know, uh, some of the tools that you learned in this course, Python and um, um, a, a library like Scikit-Learn, you know, are very useful. You know, there's a lot, you know, lots of data analytics is being done in the Python. Um, um, uh, um, ecosystem of libraries and things, but not all of it, right? So, so, so there's other tools and things that that, that you might want to learn, but, uh, but there's lots more that you could pick up for visualizing data or for these other parts, you know, like like uh, deploying real systems and things like that. Um,
And if you watch through Dr. Ring's video for his uh, his week six and his um, course uh, here, where he talks some about some things, um, there's some similar advice, but but a little bit different. Um, um, kind of more back to a little bit more of overall of, of some of the detailed checklist steps for like the the, the step five and six. So actually um, evaluating and comparing models and uh, fine tuning them. Uh, kind of more what what his video. Uh, here that I'm referring to. And again, I hope you, hope you did watch this video, his, his lecture videos. They're very good kind of um, things. You know. Lots of good information in them. You know. um, so, but, you know, a lot of these things in here, I mean, we did cover these or at least touch on these, you know, so the importance of using, uh, of splitting your data into train and test sets. Um, and then even further to have the, the training data, you, you know, if you are iterating over it, you surely have split it into validation, um, the, the, the test, the, the, no, sorry, the, the training data into uh, training and validation sets so you can iterate over it and, and have like a final test set. Um, um, Yeah, and in these videos, he kind of gets into, you know, kind of some of the important part of, of, of figuring out how your model is doing is, is you have to tune that bias versus bar variance trade-off. Okay, and we spent quite a bit of time talking about this, although maybe not quite in the same terms that he talked about, but all of the, um, uh, uh, the weeks where we were looking at um, linear regression examples, and um, you know, we we're talking about underfitting and overfitting, right? So that, that, that's all uh, uh, kind of the, the, the things that we're talking about here that, or that Dr. Ng was talking about in his videos, right? So that, that's when you are getting to kind of trying to fine tune and understanding um, a, a particular model on a particular set of data um, and trying to get it to perform better or, or figuring out whether it can perform better or not, what you're struggling with is this uh, uh, bias versus um, variance trade-off, right? So, you know, if you're underfitting, um, that's that's kind of a high bias, right? So, so basically that occurs when you're trying to apply a model that's not powerful enough uh, for the data. And you really need to um, make your model more complex. So add more, um, 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 a, a kernels uh, to, to your thing, or you know, a, a, a go to like a nonlinear um, um, model of some kind. Right. Um, and the other end of the spectrum is overfitting, so that that's high variance. So that's where um, you're not doing enough regularization, and you're let and, and you're you're using a large number of parameters um, so that you end up. Um, being able to exactly fit your training data, but in that case, you end up with a model that can't um, generalize very well um, uh, to data I hadn't seen before, so to, to validation or test data, right? So, you know, like we talked about a little bit, so the, the way, the, the normal way you detect that is uh, by having at least a, tra a train and a test set Right, so so you can detect if you're um, overfitting. You know, if you do well on the training set, like you know, typically get like 100, you know, get it completely correct on your training data, but your performance tanks on the test data or the validation data. Right, so that that's that's an indication that you're overfitting. Right? So it's still a bit of an art, but but you know, to get it just right, you have to have a model that's approximately of the right power to the underlying phenomena that you're trying to model with your um, um, machine learning with your learner, right? Um, and that you know can can fit the data well um, and can ignore the noise in that, so that it can still generalize well for, for uh, data. So this is really modeling the real signal um, and, and also kind of ignoring the the, the noise. Uh, in the data that was incidental um, to it. Um,
right? And yeah, and we did similar things to this, like this, where we were trying different degree polynomials. So that, that's a pretty explicit way to understand, um, you know, what can happen when you're when you start overfitting, right? So if, if you allow to have as many parameters as you want and give no constraints on them, you should be able to overfit the data and get pretty good or really good performance um, on the data that you train the model with. Um, but at some point, um, yeah, it, it will start doing really bad though on data that hasn't seen before once you're overfitting, right? So you typically see something like this if you compare training versus validation or training versus test uh, data over different, um, different degrees of, of the um, uh, complexity of the model, right? Or the amount of, of the parameters that you allow your model to fit to the data. Right, and, and that leads to, you know, using regularization as the kind of most basic tool. Um, so, so a typical thing is, 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 you know, you don't normally know what the correct kind of level is of the model that you want. So, so normally you would err on the side of having uh, a model that might be too complex, have too many free parameters, uh, but then you apply um, regularization uh, in order to, um, in order to fight that um, 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 the, the, the model overfitting too much. It's over to fight its tendency to overfit and, and keep it, even if, if you have too many free parameters, to keep it so that um, it's not modeling the noise too much in the data. All right, um, well, so I think I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up the video here then. Um, so if you have any questions about the remaining stuff in the course, you know, let me know. We're, I'm not gonna have a, a explicit meeting uh, next uh, Monday, so just send emails. Um, um, I, I'll post an announcement about the, the tests um, maybe here once I, once I get it up and ready to go but again it should be open starting next week on monday so um but yeah you can, you can ask me questions about it or the the fifth assignment at any time just send me an email um and uh yeah i think i'll go ahead in this video here and um, i will talk to you guys later then